Father and our King, we thank you this morning, Lord God, for this wonderful class this morning on Shabbat, Lord God, such an early morning to get started learning the language that is considered pure from Zephaniah 3.9, the language of Ivrit, the language of Hebrew. We thank you, Lord God, for eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand the deep things of God. And Father, you gave us such a deep language that in every letter of Hebrew it has a meaning, it has a numerical value. And Father, as we put words together by taking one Hebrew pictograph or one letter at a time and, and place it with another, Lord God. We know that it, it, it creates concepts and pictures and ideas that are dynamic, they're not static. They're uh, uh, according to your nature because in you we live and we move and we have our being. You are the same yesterday, today and forever. You're a God not so much of time but of eternity and you've placed us within the realm of time which is within the realm of your plan, within yourself. And Father, we thank you as an eternal God. You reveal to us timeless principles, Lord God, that we can find in the scriptures. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. All right. Some of you are new from last week, and so we'll try to take it slow. We'll go start with the Aleph Bait. We try to learn five letters at a time because it's just like counting on your fingers. My daughter, who's six and a half, she'll be seven in July. She counts like that. She counts on her fingers. She had one teacher told her, don't count on your fingers. And I thought, well, gosh, I counted on my fingers to learn. So the better way to learn is to use what you have. And, and, and as long as you have your fingers working and active your limbs, why, why not use them for learning? Okay? okay? So as you kind of count either with your hands or in your head, five letters at a time, short breath, another five letters, short breath, until you get to 20 of them, you have two left, 22 letters total. Okay? Then we'll do our vowels one time through, just sounding them out. The A-E-I-O-U is A-E-I-O-U, as it is in Spanish or Mediterranean languages, okay? Start with uh, a countdown. One, two, three. Allah, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Zayn, Het, Tet, Yud, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samet, Ein, Pei, Tzadi, Kuf, Resh, Shin, Tav. Tov, Meho, very good. Our vowels one time through, one, two, three. A, E, I, O, U. All right. So when you think vowels, you have to think uh, the A, E, I, O, U in English is A, E, I, O, U. There are various markers, but just for simplicity, if I have lines underneath a consonant letter in Hebrew, what sound will we hear? from the Mediterranean sounds. What sound will we hear? Ah. ah, if I see lines. Most of the time, if I see lines, I'm going to think an ah sound. There are a few exceptions, but they're learned. It's like I before E except after C. You just learn those unique situations where it might be something different, okay? Mm -hmm. If I see multiple dots, like a series of eggs, what sound do I hear? Eggs. Egg. So those multiple dots remind us of eggs, which have uh, an S sound, okay? If I see one dot under a letter, just like an I has one dot, what sound does the I have? E. 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 So, so far we have what sounds? A, E, E. And then we know the Vav, which is normally a V, the sixth letter on your list, the Vav. Uh, if there's a dot on top, it has what sound? Oh. oh. How do we rem remind ourselves of that? Oh. oh. Look at that bird in the air, right? And if there's a dot on the side of the vav, just like the woman that has a purse, a really nice purse on, on her side, what do we say, ladies? Ooh. Ooh, look at that nice purse, okay. So multiple dots, um, just to write them out, they go from long to, sh to, to reduced, or long, medium, short to reduced. So if I go long, medium, short, and then R for reduced, the A, E, I, O, and U, and notice I'm writing from right to left, because that's how Hebrew is written, the right way, from right to left. The ah sounds here, or I should put it, 
on the side, so we don't tick away from our L here. The A, E, E, O, and U sound, we have what looks like a little T under a letter. That is Patach. You'll learn that as time goes on. If you have a handout, or someone near you has a handout, Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, come on, you're right. Be, my, my brain is, doesn't have enough coffee yet, so <laughs> this is, yeah, this is kamatz. The patat looks just like it, so kamatz is, looks like a little T under a letter, mm -hmm. and it's going to have an ah sound, but it's going to be long, so it's going to sound like what? Ah. Uh, 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 right. The medium one will be more like ah. Uh, okay, ah. Uh, okay, and that will be one line. So if you see multiple lines, or at least one line, we know it's an ah sound, but it'll be longer for the one that looks like a T, and the one that looks just like a hyphen, that's going to be a medium length, okay? And then to shorten even more, we use what's called a shiva. It looks like a colon on the side. On the right of it, you'll notice, it goes from long to medium to short, and in this case, we don't really have a reduced symbol, okay? So, if we take a look, at the vowel chart here, you can see just for the the long, the medium, the short, we have a series of examples. Mm. Now, we can also have the hey following, but hey is an H sound, so just like in English, hey, mm -hmm. uh, H at the end of a word like Sarah, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't pronounce it. It just kind of keeps the ah sound going, but it doesn't really have a sound all by itself, because hey is really like, it's very soft. So unless it's starting the word or in the, in the middle, it doesn't really have a sound at the end of a word, okay? So if I see multiple dots, starting with two dots side by side, mm -hmm. it's going to be a. Uh, an E sound, but it's going to be E. It's a long E sound, okay? Three dots will be medium. So we have this called Seire, and this is Sibol. And then if I want to shorten even more, I'm going to use that Shiva again. Mm -hmm. That Shiva normally by itself is a short E sound, and it reduces any letter to a quick E, eh, E, eh, really quick, E. Eh. Eh. So if it's put with a, um, a T, it would be T. If it's put with a D, it would be D. If it's put with an SH, it would be SH. Mm -hmm. So it's really quick, <coughs> shortened sound. I'm going to use this Shiva right next to the Sagol. Right. This is what Elohim is sounded with. The first letter of Elohim is <clears throat> Aleph, but it gets a sound from the, the Sagol here that is reduced, um, which is called Hatef Sagol. And so this is reduced. So what it is, is the three dots in a downward triangle, plus on the right of it, it starts with a Shiva. Okay? So... And so, one dot by itself, just like the dot on the I, underneath the letter, it's going to give me an E, okay? And normally, to make it nice and long, we're going to actually have a Yud following it. So, with a Yud, it's long, and then you can also have just one dot by itself, okay? So notice that you only have two I, I options, the E sound, and that is with a yud. Now, this is normally a consonant letter. This is the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The, little, the yud is a picture of a little hand. It looks like a little hand, like this in the air. It's um, a picture of a yad, a hand. So yud looks like yad. Notice the, the sound, the, the yud, the y-u-d, and the yad, the y-a-d, the only difference is a vowel. In Hebrew, many words have the same root letters. You just change up the vowels to have shades of meaning. So this little Yud is supposed to look like a little hand. It's how we spell the name of God. Yud He, Vav He, which we hear the first two letters when we say Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, respectfully, we don't uh, pronounce the name. Uh, it's a, a respectful way to honor. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain, or literally lift it up in vanity. Uh, and so, in general conversation, we say Hashem, uh, Baruch. Hashem means blessed be the name. Or in reading, blessing, and singing, we say what? Adonai, which is the Lord. Notice the English tradition is to do the same. All capital letters, L-O-R-D. Yah is in our Torah portion today. Yah is in our Torah portion. Yeah, in uh, Exodus 15, isn't it? Yeah, because Yah 
which is the shortened form of the name uh, for yud he vav the Tetragrammaton, uh, is usually heard even in English when you say Isaiah, Jeremiah, you hear ya at the end. If you say names like Daniel, El is the word for God in the shortened form, like Elohim. So Daniel means El, God, is judge. Dan, like the tribe of Dan, means judge. So Daniel means God is judge. And so in Hebrew, usually the prophet names or our king's names always had the name of God or the name or his specific name or memorial name, <coughs> yud heh vav -Hey, in some form of it. It could have yud heh vav as Isaiah is Yeshayahu, the Vav being now changed into a U sound by putting the dot on the side. Or it could just be like Eliyah or Eliyahu. Either way, whether you have two four letters of his name or four, three letters of his name or four letters of his name, he's still himself. In the same way I could say Tom and Thomas, right? Ed, Eddie, and Edward. All forms of the same name, correct? Same thing with Hebrew. Yeshua, which is Joshua, um, is uh, really Yehoshua in Hebrew. It gets shortened in Aramaic as Yeshua. So two forms of the same name, which would be the same name that we call the Messiah, Yeshua. Okay? So we see that the dot is, is for a vowel, I pronounce E. And then what we've been discussing about the vowel, if the dot's on top, it makes what sound? Ooh. Ooh. Oh. 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 Oh, look at that bird in the air. See the dots high up in the air? Oh, look at that bird in the air. What about the dot on the side? Ooh. Ooh. Look at that, purse. Look at that nice purse, ladies. <laughs> right? Woman with a purse on her side. Okay? So the guys like the oh, and the girls like the ooh. ooh. Okay? So, um, the other way to make an O oh is just to take off the valve and put the dot floating in the air. Like in the name Moshe. Moses is Moshe, and there's no valve. It's just a dot floating in the air between the two letters of Mem and Shin, followed by a Sukol He. Okay? So Moshe uses this form. Okay? So notice with the O, the dot is medium if there's no Vav. So the Vav is the longer way to write it. And then we have two other forms. This is where I said there's sometimes exceptions. Every once in a while in certain words, the, the Kamats is used for an O, but you learn when it's used, again, like uh, you learn in English, how this word's pronounced. Nope. Not. 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 What if I do this? No. 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 Why the vowel change? Yeah, so here you, so, but why though, is the question. Right? We just learn these things. I'm teaching my daughter this now. Like, okay, so not is a short vowel versus a long vowel. I have to teach her that. She has to learn, but she wants to make this an O, but she can't always pronounce it O because without the E, the silent E at the end, I can't, I can't do that. I have to actually say not, and mm -hmm. the O becomes an A sound. Mm -hmm. right. No different from Hebrew. Right. Every once in a while now, what was the A is now used as an O, and then in its shortest form, you put the Shabbat again, reduced. Okay? Again, these are so few and in between, you just learn when they are. There's certain words you learn, like the word kol. You learn when it's used and when it's not used. Okay? And then, of course, the other way to do a U sound is if you see kibbutz, three dots, and a 45 degree angle underneath the letter. There you go, that's it. All right? So, let's put the vowels in the first <coughs> letters of the Torah portion for Bishalach. This is one of the most fascinating, most empowering portions of the Torah you'll ever read about. In fact, most of you know that Exodus 15, of the book of Shemot, Exodus 15, gives us the Shirat Hayam, which is the song of the sea. And this is where Israel goes on dry ground, and the water on the left and on the right of them goes up like a wall. And even the Torah portion, you see brick-like patterns of phrases of Exodus 15 to look like a wall. Because when the scribe or the sofer writes the Torah scroll, he makes your songs have a poetic and artistic look to them. So when you see it, like the Ten Words of the Ten Commandments, or when you see Song of Moses, or you see the Song of the Sea, you go, oh, that's a song right there. That's poetic. This is something special. This is not just everyday writing. This is a special thing that we should look and focus on it. 
and looking at every letter and the way they're shaped teaches you something about what the rabbis believe is going on even behind the text. So they'll reduce letters, they'll lengthen letters or enlarge them, they'll do a lot of different things. They'll space out letters in certain ways on purpose uh, these special scribes, these special rabbinical scribes, do this on purpose to have teaching tools so that when a student, like a young boy, learns the Torah, he sees something special and he'll say, hey, why is this? Why do we keep Passover? Right. For the purpose of teaching our children where we came from. Right. Passover is all about the children. When you read the Haggadah, when you read in the Haggadah, you read in the ha ha Haggadah certain things and there's you know, four questions, right? There's even four type of children that will ask these questions. Some are concerned, some are not so concerned. Some are really, really good students, others just don't seem to care. And so the Torah talks about these children in your household. They're going to say, why do we keep this service? Why do we keep doing Passover year after year? Because we never want to forget where we came from. You see, Jewish identity, you know, this, this concept of, 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 of uh, uh, being... Jewish. It's, it's, it's more than just a bloodline. It's more than just a language. It's more than just knowing a little bit of Yiddish, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this, this concept of being, uh, understanding where we came from as a people, this is the key to understanding the Torah. Mm -hmm. That it's God selecting all the way from Adam through Noah, then Abram, who became Abraham, then Isaac and Jacob, and then down to the 12 tribes, and then to the tribe of Judah, who, who David and Solomon came from, and all the way till we get to a belief that Messiah is the son of David, according to all the rabbis. The Messiah has to be the son of David. You see, God takes a very broad um, a scope of humanity and narrows it down. That narrow is the way, the truth, and the life. All the nations have knowledge, but there's a select knowledge that has been passed down through the Jewish people. If it wasn't for the Jewish people, we wouldn't have the Torah, we wouldn't have the, the prophets and the writings known as the Tanakh, we wouldn't have the scriptures. And, and, and the Christian world needs to know you wouldn't even have the New Testament. Because everything in the New Testament should be based upon what was already written, not to write something new. It's a renewal in a new generation in our hearts as the Holy Spirit takes the Torah and writes it there as he takes his commands and writes it there. Nothing in the New Testament should undo what Moses said, what Isaiah said, or anyone else uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the kings all the way to the priests. Nothing should be undone, except sin. That's the only thing we want to undo in our life is the repeating of sins over and over again. So why do we tell the story? So that they will never forget. As a reminder, a zikaron. Zikaron is the Hebrew word for remembrance. So when we remember, we're going backwards so we can pull it forward. How can we learn from ancient history? Let's not just let it be ancient history. Let it be his story that we're reliving year after year. We're learning the lessons that he's teaching us. Okay? Amen. So um, if we then start with this statement, this comes from Exodus chapter 13, verse uh, 7, 16, 17, 17, I want to So can we get a reader to read that for us? Be nice from the complete Jewish Bible. So, uh, if we could read <coughs> Exodus 13, 17, which is the beginning of Parsha Beshalach, which literally means he sent them out. He didn't let them go, he sent them out. Just please get out of here. <laughs> okay. So, I'd like to read. Ed and I said to Moshe, Sit aside from the womb among the people of Israel, both of humans and of animals. Wait, wait. Exodus 13. 13. Yeah. One. Right. You didn't say what I said. Seventeen. That's okay. So sorry. That's okay. Oh, seventeen. Okay. After Pharaoh had led the people go, let the people go. God did not guide them to the highway that goes through the land of the Philistines. So the Philistines. The Philistines. 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 Philistines is the Philistines. Okay. Philistines <laughs> because it was close by. God thought that the people upon sea and war might change their minds and return to Egypt. Rather, God led the people by a roundabout route through the desert by the Sea of Surf. 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 Su. Su. It's Su. a oo sound, right? Ooh. A U is a oo. Ooh. 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 Right? So this is the sound here. Ooh. Okay. Or oh, excuse me, ooh. The people of Israel went up from the land of Egypt fully armed. Moshe took the bones of Yosef with him for Yosef had, Yosef. Made, Yosef had made the people of Israel swear an oath when he said, 
God will certainly remember you, and you are to carry the, my bones up with you away from here. All right, that's, that's good. Thank you. Um, so here we have the beginning. Um, your, your, the complete Jewish Bible, how did it read for the very first couple of words before it says Pharaoh sent him out? What was the first words of the, of the verse? Your version says what? Mine says, and it was when Pharaoh. And it was. Okay, what does the complete Jewish Bible say? How does the verse start at 17? After Pharaoh. Okay, after. Your version says what? And it was. And it was, and yours is the? Uh, one new man. One new man version. Okay, so notice we have two different translations. Anybody else reading along and have a different translation? Yes. Now it came about. When now it came about, okay. As it was, now it came about, and then... <coughs> After. After. <laughs> How is it that all these translations have different words? Because there are different There's translations similar. for all the different words. Yes. And depending on what the translation is depends on what it means. Yeah, so the, the key is not to, to rely on translations, mm -hmm. but to actually go back to the original Hebrew, which is why it's so important you're in this class. So we know that out of 22 Hebrew letters, 11 of them can be a prefix. So, not only is every letter in Hebrew a pictograph, that means it is a picture of something, like hieroglyphics. Um, for instance, the Aleph being an ox head, the Beit being a house, the Gimel being a camel, the uh, Dalet being a door. We know that it's important to see when there's a prefix in a word. So the very first letter is a prefix. And in English, it would be marked incorrect. We'd actually take our red pen, if we were doing uh, 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 an essay, and we'd say, okay, this is incorrect. Why? Because you don't start a sentence with and. But in Hebrew, it makes perfect sense, because the letter vav, which is used for and, is a hook. Mm -hmm. And the Torah is hooked one portion to another. Mm -hmm. So therefore, to start a portion, a passage, a paragraph with and makes perfect sense in Hebrew, because the picture of this little guy here is a hook, or something that nails two things together. So if I say boys and girls, I could say um, um, yeladim be yaldot. So yeladim be yaldot, that would be boys and girls, or yeled be yalda, a boy and a girl. So vav would be used as a prefix to the word. So actually it says and to start. That's the first word of the text, and. It is prefixed to the actual verb here, which we looked at last week. The verb is haya. Okay? So here's the verb root. In Hebrew, every word is based upon a root of primarily three letters that we call a shoresh. Okay? And it's funny, shoresh is shin, resh. Sheen, basically, as, as for root letters. Okay, so here we have haya, hey, you, hey. The fifth letter, the the, the tenth letter, and the fifth letter again. Okay, haya. What does haya mean? Was. Was. Okay. And it is from the verb what? To be. To be. Is there a present tense form of to be in Hebrew? No. What I need am is an R, as far as a Hebrew word to translate it into. What I, do I need those words in Hebrew? No, they're understood. So when I say, I am Brian, I actually say, ani, which is the pronoun I. Everyone say, ani. Ani. Now, yell out your name. Shema. Brian. Okay, do it in Hebrew. Our own, or Baruch, as uh, my, my Hebrew teacher likes to call me, Baruch. Uh, so, when you say, I am, you don't need am. It's understood. It would be like saying, I am, and I could say, More, More is a teacher. I would have to say, Ha Moe. I, I am the teacher, to be specific. Okay, so I would say ani, and I wouldn't need am, it's understood. So the only form of the verb we write is the past tense, and the past tense can be translated future tense. Hmm. Okay, now, in Hebrew you primarily have perfect and imperfect verbs. That means perfect, it's completed, mm -hmm. imperfect, it's not completed yet. So something that has already come to pass is completed. Okay, so what we have here is 
a form of this verb, uh, we have va-yahi, va-yahi. So let's put in the vowels here. And this is translated, and it came to pass. So we have underneath the va, we have va. We have the shva here, and we have a dot. So how do we transliterate this? Let's pick a different color. What do we say the first letter is? Stick with the red. Okay, so we have what? Let's make room. So I'm gonna have to write over here. So we have the V, and we have an A sound, right? Va. Okay. And then we have the letter U. It's here a consonant letter because there's a vowel underneath. Right. If there was no markings underneath the letter U, it'd be used as a vowel. It's the, it would be an extended vowel from here. Okay. In this case, it's, it's, you would actually put a Y here. What's underneath it? Shava. Shava. So we put that there. Mm -hmm. So it's going to get a quick yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have the letter hey. What's that? H. H. And then we have nine. Va ye he. Va ye he. This means and it came to pass. Va ye he. So the verb that really speaks of the main action and it came to pass is be shalach. Let's put the vowels in here. I forgot to close in my window there, make that offense. Be shalach. What we have here is the prefix be. The prefix bait. Okay, what is bait a picture of? Oh. A house. So we use it for in or in the. Because when you have a house, what's it built for? People come into the house, right? Mm -hmm. So it's used as the word in. Just as the hook is used for and. Because a hook hooks two things together the way and, as a conjunction, hooks two things together. So here we have a uh, letter bait, which is used for in because it's a picture of a what? House. House. So we have, and it came to pass, in, right? Now what is this root here, shalach? Does anybody know what shalach is? Well, for. for. No. Future. Generation. No. No, it's a verb. Oh, the verb is this. Go to walk. Huh? To walk. No, halak is to, to go. walk. To like halakha. Halak, halakic rulings on the way of Jews to walk in the Gentile world. That's, that's the verb to walk or to go. What is this verb here? To go. He didn't tell him go anywhere. No. See, this is the problem with our English. Our English says that Pharaoh let them go. He didn't let them go. He sent them out. This is the root to sin. This actually shalak is the root to sin, you can find it in any strong concordance, and it means he sent out. That's what it means. So literally in sending them out, who? Pharaoh. So now we have to have par o. The dot here strengthens the pe. Uh, without the dot it would be a ph sound or an f sound. F, fe, right? So here we have par o. Make sure. It's a red pen. Alright, so here we have part O, which okay, it's gonna have a patak underneath. The resh, which is an R, is gonna have the Shiva for par. And then we have O, which is we're gonna have a floating dot in the air between the ein and the hey. Remember, there are two silent letters. Does anybody remember what the silent letters are? It's number one and number sixteen on the list. Aleph and ein. Aleph and ein. They're silent letters. That means they can take any vowel marking underneath. So an aleph can actually have an a sound, an e sound, an s sound, depending on the vowel that's put underneath. The ein does the same thing. So we can actually have an o sound from both aleph and from ein. So the first letter and the sixteenth letter of Hebrew are silent letters. Think of a shofar. 
and until you blow the ram's horn, the shofar, you don't have sound. Mm -hmm. So they're silent, like a ram's horn is, a shofar is, and until you blow through the, uh, the, the instrument, this wind instrument, a certain sound, it doesn't make noise. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is par O. Who's par O? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Okay, so this is the actual Hebrew word for Pharaoh. Okay, so who's sending them out? Pharaoh. Pharaoh, Pharaoh is. <coughs> Does he have a strong pressure from God to send them out? Yes. Yes. What were they? Uh, the plagues. The plagues. Okay. So here we have et. What is et? Direct a direct object indicator. Direct object indicator. Okay. What are the letters to make up et? Aleph Tav. We, we, we talked about the fact that this is translated uh, one time as to plow, and it's the picture of an ox or an ox head and a cross or mark to mark the spot. And when an ox would plow a field, he would be directing himself as the ox <coughs> towards a mark with his yoke on him and plowing the field so he'd make sure the plow was in a straight line. So the ancient pictographs of this is an ox plowing towards a mark or directing towards something. A straight line towards something. Mm -hmm. And so it's used in Hebrew, like in Genesis, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'ar. It's in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So what is the general rule about the direct object indicator? Between a, a verb and a direct object, we need to use et. Mm -hmm. So if I say I love you, I have to use et. Because there's a direct object, someone I'm loving specifically. Okay, so who is Pharaoh sending out? <coughs> Who's Pharaoh sending out? Uh -huh. Ha'am. Uh -huh. So what we have here is people, the people, not a people, but the people. He's sending out the people, okay? So we're referring to Israel. So in this beginning statement, we have a structure of, and it was, or and it came to pass, in sending in Pharaoh sending out, notice the verb controls even uh, the subject here, Be uh, Shalach, which is the name of the portion, Par O et Ha'am. So, and it came to pass that Pharaoh sent out the people. Yeah, it came to pass after ten plagues, right? <laughs> Can you explain that again about the, the direct object? The okay, so for instance, when we say the very famous Ve'ahavta, <coughs> which is next to the Shema, it's one of the most important prayers in Judaism. Can we hear the Shema? Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Does anybody know why we say that part softer? Yeah, because it's not in the scripture. It's not in the scripture. It's a blessing to God, but it's not the same as the word. Right. So you vocally, loudly say what is scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 4, but you, we soften the Baruch Shem Kavod because we're just saying in response, a softer response, blessed be his glorious name, his kingdom is forever and ever, and amen. But we're blessing his name because he is one, but it's not scripture. So we're loudly saying the scripture because it's straight from the word of God, but we're softening the blessing as just a simple response. We don't give it the same elevated level as God's word, because God's word is elevated above, right? He elevates his word even above his own name. And when you say the name, the rabbis have given us the instruction to bless him. Like, for instance, sometimes you'll hear Baruch Shem, um, uh, Baruch Shemo, um, and which means blessed be his name, or, um, or uh, blessed be the Holy One. Um, so we know that these statements of blessing are not on the same level as scripture, so that's why it's said. The very next thing we say after that is, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Echa. So Ve'ahavta and Ve'ahavta, which this ending means, and you shall love. Ahav is the root. Ohev is. Um, is the word to love, right? Mm -hmm. I would say ani, ohev, otach to my wife. Ani ohev otach. And this is, otach is taking the direct object indicator and putting a suffix at the end, otach. So what it's saying is, I love you, but I'm using the direct object indicator for the you part. I'm adding the you at the end of ala, tach. 
So it, it's a little tricky right now, but just know that you have to use direct object indicator even to say, I love you. Because you're loving who? Not someone generic, someone specific. I love you. Right. Specifically you, right? Yes. So, um, ve'ahavta et Adonai. Why? Because God is specific. Mm -hmm. I, and you shall love the Lord, or Yudhevavhe, or the Adonai, or Hashem, right? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So every time I say, of, I use a verb, and I direct that verb toward a direct object, I need something to indicate that something is being plowed by the ox towards something direct. So these two letters, Aleph and Tav, are used. It's funny, in the book of Revelation, they get translated to Alpha and Omega. <laughs> so in a sense, we see that even some of the rabbis have said in the beginning, Messiah is in the text. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because he's the Aleph and the Tav. He's the ox plowing towards that mark or that cross or that, that uh, concept. So, again, this is using Hebrew. Do we translate et most of the time? No. No. Sometimes it gets translated as with, but the actual Hebrew word for with is im. So, that's the reason why we use it. It's not translated, it's just something in Hebrew that's used as a tool to say, I have a verb, an action, that is moving towards a direct object. So I have to place between the, the verb and the action, uh, the, the verb and the and the subject, the direct object, at. It's just a rule. We just learn it that way. It's one of those things we have to do. So the indication that it's direct is it's not am, um, which is people, but it's ha am. Um. And how do we say chosen people? God's chosen people. Am segula. So we would say ha am um, ha segula for the chosen people. So, am hasegula, or am ha, ha am hasegula, which is the chosen people, or the people, the chosen, is what you're really saying in Hebrew, okay? So, again, Israel is called am segula, the chosen people. So, this is the, the first few words of the Torah. We'll hear it in the Torah uh, service and the processional and in the reading today. And so, now you're at least aware of why we call it Be Shalach, all right? Let's close with prayer. Abinu Malkinu, our Father and our King, we thank you this morning for your blessing upon this day that you've given us as a gift. You said man was not made for Shabbat, but Shabbat was made for man. And all the way back in the Garden of Eden, when you created the world six, in six days, and you told man to enter into that rest, you blessed them and you blessed it, that, Father, we would have a blessing today. After six days, we would count the seventh as a day of blessing, a day of refreshing, a day of renewal. Father, you sat down or rested on that day as king over your creation. We pray that we would rest and call you king of the universe, sovereign Lord today. And that Father, we would rest in the finished work of your son, Yeshua. And Father, all these blessings we have in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank Thank you. All right. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Hope you're so. And uh, let's have a good service this morning. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord grant you his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace Adonai, but I will let her be your sin.